Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. And I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Iron Hack, teach at IE Business School University and so much more and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, Engagers, welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game Podcast. And we have today with us Keith Pond. But Keith, before we take off, we need to know, are you prepared to engage? Absolutely, Rob. I'd engage with uh, your favorite thing and something I found to be very, very beneficial for my students. <laughs> that sounds absolutely fantastic because we have Keith with us today, who is the EFMD Global Online Course Certification Scheme Director. Those are the people who are basically EFMD is the European. Well, I, I, I'm not sure if we should say that anymore, but the EFMD, you know, basically is one of the organizations who is certifying many things for business schools worldwide. One of them is, and a very important one as well, is the online course certification systems of which Keith is actually the director. And he's been working with EFMD since 2014 to design and implement EOX, which is exactly that certification scheme. He's managing a small but very experienced team that he leads various digital initiatives, including the EOX online community of practice. And he maintains an intensely practical approach to his role and champions e-learning and employability development at school, university, national, and international levels. He has a wide experience in teaching internationally and of involvement in international higher ed education projects, including banking simulation-based interventions, both face-to-face -face and online. And he's a former banking professional, and he's an active member of the London Institute of Banking and Finance with interest in credit appraisal, insolvency, and operational management. And he is also operates his own educational consultancy focusing on design and delivery of research, webinars, and workshops tailored to the needs of individual institutions. So, Keith, lots of exciting stuff going on there. Uh, I don't know it's if we missed anything. It's been a long career. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we missed anything from, from that intro. No, you, you're fine. I mean, the, it, it's a lot of it comes by just being in the right place at the right time, but also just loving working with other people uh, and looking for those opportunities. They say that luck is when effort or, or, or work meets opportunity. So <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd subscribe to that. <laughs> so Keith, you know, we always like to get to know our, our guests a little bit further than the intro. And we would like to know what does a regular day or a week, what does being Keith nowadays feel like? It feels very relaxed, Rob. <laughs> I've worked for 40 years on and off as an academic. I was previously a banker. And really, my ideal was to work by myself a lot of the time, but also to work with others, but to have flexibility in my career. Now, in banking, that wasn't possible, nine to five or even longer hours in an office. So when I switched to working at a university, yeah, the hours were more flexible. The work was just as much. But then, of course, <laughs> COVID came along and we all had to retreat to our homes or our sheds or our outhouses, our bunkers to do our job. And this is what my regular day now looks like. It is standing because I've got a standing desk in front of two very bright monitors, a microphone, a webcam, and I'm ready to serve the world. And I do my teaching, my workshops, my consultancy meetings, and managing the whole EOX process, which we designed to be online for online courses, completely from the comfort of my own home. That sounds fantastic, exciting, <laughs> and very well adapted to your role as well. So good to know, good to know that these are the things that are going on and they're going well as well. And now we'd like to dive deep, right? We'd like to know one of those times of, you know, you were going north, things went south, what we like to call a fail or a first attempt at learning, because we know we learn a lot from these moments as well. So Keith, do you have anything around this, maybe around simulations or, or learning online? I don't know, where, where, wherever you want to guide us. Uh, yes. And I, I bring us back to COVID 
once again because at the time that that particular set of lockdowns started uh, and we all retreated to home, I was halfway through a simulation pilot for an online banking simulation with four universities, my own Loughborough and three across Europe, who had collaborated in the past in face-to-face simulations, but we'd designed something that was going to be completely online for our students. And although the pilot went through okay, COVID came along and shut it down once it had had its pilot. There was no possibility through budgetary reasons, through really the individual's attention being taken away just to do the day job, not to add something extra like a simulation, which would you know, create extra work above the, the norm for people in those universities. So, yeah, COVID was the catalyst for a failure. But what did I learn from that? Well, I learned from that that we needed to have better funding at the start. We needed to have a bit of a better strategy that the pilot was okay, but we needed a second stage, which had funding tied up with it. And the funding was really to pay the game license for the simulation to take place and for prize money. Because, and I seem to remember a seminar led by one Rob Alvarez, who said competition (laughs) is you know, really at the heart of of gamification. You've got to have an element of competition. And so we thought a monetary prize would encourage those who, those students who were doing the, the, the work, but not embedded in their curriculum. So the prize wasn't marks and credits for their course, but there, there was a monetary prize. So that was the thing that we, that we lacked the finance to continue. And I think that was the failure. Uh, the enthusiasm was maintained throughout. Sounds definitely like a project that you would be involved in for sure. And and Keith, from that lesson, is, is there something like, again, let's imagine, you know, you don't know next COVID is coming or whatever comes up, but you're in a similar situation. What would you do differently? Like providing that additional funding, how would that look like? Like how would you approach it perhaps in a different way? Well, I think this is something that came out of our collaboration, we had four universities involved, two of whom were able to embed the simulation in a module that they already had running, so a credit-bearing module. And that was two out of four of us because the, the notice period for my university particularly was far too short to embed it in a syllabus, but these other universities had greater flexibility. So one of the lessons was, well, let's look for partners that have the flexibility to embed this or already have something in their curriculum into which a learning product like this, a, le- a learning experience like this can be put. And let's say that that's, I think, one of the things we learned. Let's choose our partners so that we can keep that going longer term. Once it's embedded in a curriculum, hmm. it will continue because there's the fees or the funding comes from the fees paid by the students. Yes. It doesn't have to be external. So that's one of the lessons that, that we <laughs> that we learned. And I'd take forward if I was taking this further. Sounds fantastic. So Keith, let's actually take a spin and go for one of those times when things went right. You know, you were using again a simulation or one of these interactive possibilities and potentials that you've explored very well in the past few years and things went your way you know you're happy with the results maybe you want to share some some proud moments or something because we want to be there with you again share that story and perhaps understand a couple of those you know learning factors that you say ah these were good things that we did well i'm i'm going to use that focus of that simulation that was there at the beginning of 2020 and, and halted through COVID. We still ran it to its end during the lockdown. But the success came earlier. So this was 2020 that we did this particular simulation exercise. But back in 2004, we'd done this face-to-face. So the success was in making sure this simulation hit the right notes as far as the experience and the expertise of the students were concerned. And we used the 
Erasmus intensive program funding from the EU to physically take six students from each of, I think, six universities in the end to a location. We held this in Liechtenstein, we held it in Malta, we held it in Riga, we held it in Helsinki and in Loughborough. So over the years, these opportunities to get together and play what was a, a, a sort of the simulation was based in various laptops. So it, it was on a, on a USB stick. It wasn't web based. But we got the experience and the expertise of how it would work, how we could get students to work with it alongside studying finance, alongside studying and reflecting, alongside working with each other from six different nationalities, six different universities, and, and really getting the most out of that experience. So we, we learned that it, it worked. We got it down to it, fine-tuned it so that it worked very well by the end of the sixth iteration. And that was what, uh, say, a success that we, we built on. The thing stopping us taking that further was that it wasn't web-based. And we had to wait until the developers actually made this web-based or, or something similar would become available, which it did. So we engaged with the developers and piloted it in, in a web-based format. And that was the, the 2020. So it's taken a long time, but it's helped to keep those partners together all around Europe to keep them enthusiastic enough to sort of want to come back if we could put this together again. Well, sounds like a big story of success as well, you know, getting through all the things that you've managed to get through and leaving the door open for further collaboration, I'm guessing, right? Absolutely. And as I say, we've learned a lot of lessons. And one of the biggest uh, challenges right from the start was timing. Not that time zones were a problem, but timing within the term time, the semester time of six different institutions. There were so few opportunities in the year where we could pinpoint when this would be viable and sensible for all of those institutions. We got there in the end, but that did take quite a bit of fine tuning to get there. And Keith, talking about these things, you've, you've talked about this one in particular. So I, I think I'm guessing that we can do a, a bit of a deeper dive into, into, this, uh, into the, these simulations. What was your sort of process of, of getting there like how did you decide to go for this you know what happened next you know why were you doing it you, you just mentioned you had some difficulties sort of putting all these things together how did that look like we we, we would like to, 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 know, to know a little bit more about that well i think i was the main catalyst for taking the it further beyond the erasmus initiative because I'd been there from the start my university and one other the university of Liechtenstein were partners in this from the very start, and we stayed the course. And in fact, they were included in this web-based version. So we were able, over time, to liaise with the software house to rewrite parts of the simulation, to make it, because we were finance people, they were games simulation specialists, and this is how we helped them make it more realistic. One of the other things to make it more acceptable was we translated the whole thing into English. It was originally in German. <laughs> and that was obviously not as accessible around the world as, as a version in English. So we actually sat there and made sense of the translated and made sense of the manuals and the interface. So we got to know them pretty well and we kept in touch with them until there was a time when this could become web-based. And they were looking to launch this. So various uh, things led me to Dublin in Ireland, where a consultant was working. He was teaching at a Dublin-based university in finance using this simulation, the face-to-face the -face version or the, the, sort of the, the tablet-based version. And, and I, I talked to him and said, look, are they working on a web-based version? Because I've got an idea that I think could, could work here. And he said, yes, they are. Feedback was that this was ready for launch. So, And this is over a timescale of about a couple of years, keeping in touch with him, 
making sure that we could get the correct number of licenses to run a pilot. And then I had the great fortune to be on a sabbatical uh, from my work. (laughs) And I planned a train trip around Europe. Actually, it was very, very reasonably priced train trip around Europe. But I got on a train at my local station and I went to uh, Switzerland, to Liechtenstein, through to Germany, back through Holland. But I was able to talk to, didn't quite get to Malta this time, but able to talk to all the people face to face to engage them in the project. And then I could launch the project once I'd got some initial seed corn funding. And I knew my university had that sort of funding available. So I bid for it, got the money, and we were ready to go. And, and what, was the, what was the objective of, of, this, of this whole project? Excellent question, Rob. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, really the objective was that in traditional universities, you know, the preponderance of learning is through discussions, it's through lectures, tutorials, seminars, but actually students learn also through activity and they learn through collaboration. And these things were very often missing in a standard business syllabus, a standard uh, curriculum for a finance program. And so the objective was well, let's see if this can work in finance programs at very good universities. Let's see if if the students are able to function with it, able to use the software. That was easy, easily achieved. It was very accessible software. And we could show that their collaboration, their skills development, the authenticity of some of the decisions they were making was beneficial to them. So that was the objective, to actually inject skills and development of skills alongside their finance knowledge in an authentic way within the curriculum. And as I say, two out of the four universities uh, we were working with were able to do that immediately within the curriculum. My next step would have been, if COVID hadn't happened, to go to my university and say, look, we can embed this in, as it happens, a master's course because the simulation could be geared to whatever level of study uh, was needed. It could be made more complicated. It could be made more accessible. So that was my key objective, because I've been working to get practical skills into the curriculum of tr- a traditional university for quite some uh, long time. <laughs> Not a small task. <laughs> no, no, indeed. The, the second thing, if, if we continued, was the internationalization. And I mean, I'm using words that you, you introduced me as, as director uh, with uh, a QS director with EFMD Global. And that is one of the things that that accreditation system really encourages. And so, you know, internationalization, what better than the facilities given to us by the web to be able to give our students international experience, international collaboration without leaving the comfort of their homes. Okay, there's huge benefits in traveling, but in a sustainable world, how can we do this on a bigger scale without Mm. burning carbon and and air miles? So that was the sort of the second stage would get students working in mixed international groups rather than in their university groups. But we'd say we never got that far. (laughs) It's a shame. That's too bad. I'm, I'm sure the future still holds some hope for, for that project. I hope so too, Rob. Just a quick break before we continue with this episode. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I would really appreciate if you share it with your friends and family and on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, it's at Rob Alvarez B and the hashtag Professor Game, all one word. And in Facebook, you can find the Professor Game page. Thanks in advance for your engagement. So, Keith, what would you say, you know, after these experiences that you've had with simulations, with experience-based learning, you know, your role as a director of EOX and so on, would you say that there is some form of a best practice, some form of, you know, a key learning, something that you say, oh, if you do this when you're using simulations in higher education, this is something that you'll definitely benefit your project if you do or think about these things? Competition is the first thing, that there must be an element of 
competition and that regular reporting back in our case on a week by week basis but we have run this simulation on a you know over a period of 3 days in an intensive way with say uh, MBA students before now but there's that feedback who's in the lead who's getting closer to the targets and the second thing is authenticity the simulation really has to reflect how things work so the algorithms within them the way that the in in the case of a finance simulation the economic environment can change the way decisions are made and the things can be changed to increase the level of difficulty or in, you know increase the authenticity and that way students and learners get far more out of it because they'll remember actually how do we tackle that sort of problem when they are doing these things for real in their careers absolutely so on one hand the competition and i just want to highlight here the fact that you know competition is very useful especially when you know you have students that tend to be competitive as tends to be the case with mba students but also when there is a limit to that competition and it's i don't know in your case but i tend to recommend not associating the results in the competition to grades which i think is something that you mentioned you went to for more of an economic prize uh, and and a limit in time as well it's not like you're competing throughout you know this is a, and uh, your whole mba or your whole period you're competing because it it can establish some interactions between the students that are you know that are that go a bit too much in there because they get they re- they can really get into the competition so that's amazing for those bursts as well of of engagement and the other thing that i found very interesting is the authenticity and here, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of t- picking uh, pieces of, of what you were saying, because one of the things is, you know, you want to make it such that whatever it is that you're simulating, because of course, real life, you know, <laughs> it, that there's just too much out there in real life for it to be completely authentic, at least at the current level that we're at, you know, with technology and even understanding of the real world. But be sure that you make it authentic to what you want to make sure it is authentic to. Right. Because, you know, you're not going to cover absolutely everything, but there are some things and there are some key learning objectives that you have there to make it authentic to that so that the lessons as well are applicable or at least the thought process that led them to that thing. Just as, you know, with a case study, just as with many other things where you generalize from that experience or you say, oh, the, the way that I thought through this was this. I think that is a fantastic recommendation as well. So thanks for those recommendations, Keith. And Keith. If you are, you know, listening to these questions and to sort of the, the, the way we've been going through this, is there somebody that comes to your mind that you would say, oh, I'd like to listen to this person answering these types of questions as well? I think it would be pretty interesting for me or, or for others. Does anybody come to mind? Yeah, it's a person we worked with on, on this project. She's a freelance uh, consultant uh, working out of Austria, a lady called Angela Feigl. And Angela is just... In, steeped in games and how they work and how they can be embedded. And she's just great. She is a bundle of energy. I'm sure you'll find your listeners and your engagers <laughs> very keen to uh, keep keep abreast of what, what Angela's thinking. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, yes, I did get, get a chance to quickly meet her. I remember as well that we were going to do a webinar together and I can't remember what it is that happened. I think it was when I caught covid and uh, I, I think I you're right, Rob, that that was it. But Ang- Angela did carry on with that uh, last July. That was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Keith, what other recommendations? Of course, we're thinking of who you would recommend. Angela is a fantastic one. Is, as far as recommendations, is there maybe a book for whether it's inspiration or straight off, you know, this is the kind of thing you do with simulations? Is there something that you could recommend us as well? Do you know, I, I mean, that's a that's a difficult one for me because I, I tend not to have time to read books about something. It, it's almost like saying, you know, of course I can ride a horse. I've read the book. I just tend to get dive in and do it and find out for myself. So I, I can't recommend a particular book on this, but there, there are some ideas come out of sort of and, and this is my, me, me, the academic speaking, sort of basic economic theory in this area of finance and banking, that very often students and learners playing these simulations don't recognize. And that is 
everything you do as a bank needs to support your reputation hmm. because once you lose your reputation as a bank, it takes a long, long time to recover it. And so making a quick buck or a quick euro by <laughs> increasing your lending margins, for example, might be profitable, but it won't be popular. And that's one of those softer things. Now, I mean, I could name you any number of economists who talk about that and, you know, how we construct trust in our minds. That sounds fantastic. So the, the building of trust is a very, very central thing to banking for sure. And in this world of, of simulations and, you know, online education and, and higher education, what would you say is your superpower, that thing that you do at least better than most other people? I think it is networking, which is weird to say that when, the, you know, the World Wide Web is its own network, but it's that human networking. <laughs> it's finding people at conferences, at gatherings, through LinkedIn, you know, people with similar interests, with perhaps a similar outlook, and then being able to cooperate with them in, in a venture. And this is how the simulations that I have run and I've been part of really built and took off until we were ready to expose ourselves on the World Wide Web with the simulation we had. The more people involved, the better. And so I'm in a very privileged position, given that I can You know, I'm invited to many, many business schools across the world to talk to them, mostly virtually these days, but sometimes physically, but to talk to them about online education. And, you know, it's one of the easy wins, easy wins. If, if there's a school starting to think about how do we go online? How can we improve these skills? How can we improve the skills in our students? You say, run a simulation a competition. It can be extracurricular, it can be embedded in the curriculum, but you will find that there'll be enthusiasm for it. And this is one of the messages when I do network around the place that I leave with people. That sounds great and a very important superpower nowadays, as well as I think since forever. <laughs> so that sounds fantastic, Keith. And again, you know, this is one of the difficult questions, uh, at least for most guests. And What would you say is your favorite game? <laughs> well, probably not a banking simulation. <laughs> um, no, I find myself, and you may find this weird, but I play a Microsoft Flight Simulator to the extent that I built my own computer with a specification that would run the latest version. <laughs> um, and so as a simulation You know, yes, you can be competitive in it the way that the thing's programmed, but also those skills that for someone who lives in their head most of the time and you know, someone as a, a professor said to me, well, what is our job? It's thinking, you know, the only problem is no one can tell when we're doing it and when we're finished. <laughs> and I find this is, is, a, is a total mirror to what I do during the day. So something that engages other bits of my brain. That is my favorite simulation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Keith, before we take off, before we, we move on to your next activity, <laughs> do you have any final quick piece of advice for the engagers? Of course, let us know where we can find more about you, about your work, perhaps about the EOX work as well. And then we'll say that it's, that it's game over. A key bit of advice, I think, is do just try it. Take the plunge. If you are an academic trying to introduce this into uh, your university, then find others who have done it. Find people like Angela or Rob or anyone like this who, who can help you put this together and just do it. You know, I <laughs> don't don't spend too long thinking about it. Just plunge in and say, this is this is what I want to achieve. And you'll find it is so, so very rewarding. So many benefits of doing this, of using simulations, of using gamification, of thinking of the engagement of your students. So thanks for those final words, Keith. Where can we find out more about you, about the EFMD, the EOX, wherever you want to lead us? Yeah, well, the EFMD main website will take you to two key links, one to EOX itself as a certification system, but 
probably more importantly for the majority of engagers, to our online community of practice, uh, something that within the business school world, we find that some institutions are very highly advanced in this area. Some are still waiting to get to the starting line and are asking, how do we even start? What do we do? And that's even after two years of emergency using Teams or Zoom and then reverting to their normal traditional way of working. So that community is is there for you know, those who have that enthusiasm and drive to want to learn from others and sometimes the mistakes of others because we, that that's really one of the most valuable things in learning is when you uh, did it wrong first time round, but you've got it right next time. That's it. And that's the way we do it as well with games, with simulations. So thanks again, Keith. Thank you for your, your experience, for sharing this time with us, for sharing your knowledge, all the things that you, the amazing things that you've done. However, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Engagers, it is fantastic to have you here. And this podcast makes sense thanks to you. So let's go ahead and connect on Twitter. That way you can let me know things like, you know, what questions you have, what we can help you with. If perhaps you have a suggestion for a future guest, you can find my Twitter account in professorgame.com slash Twitter. There I'm always sharing content on gamification on the podcast, especially around education. And before, before you click continue, remember to subscribe or follow, which is absolutely for free using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.